Welcome to the Neutral Podcast, where we discuss paving the way to a sustainable tomorrow. I'm Nate Helbach, your host, founder, and CEO of The Neutral Project, a sustainable real estate development company. Join us each week as we host world-renowned guests and explore dynamic landscapes of real estate development, alternative investing, sustainability, forestry, urbanism, and new cutting edge carbon neutral construction materials that are shaping the cities of tomorrow. Welcome everyone. I'm joined by Michael Green, founder of MGA Architects out of British Columbia and author author of Tall Wood Buildings, which I actually brought with me today. Uh, If you're tuning in via YouTube, you'll see that. Uh, He's also been on a few TED Talks And so uh, maybe to start us off, Michael, you could just give us a background on yourself and what attracted you to architecture and specifically Mass Timber. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Nate. So so first of all, I'm uh, Canadian. I'm up here in Western Canada. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I was one of those lucky kids that knew when I was a little kid, probably like age five, I was going to be an architect. So I, um, but I didn't even know what that was. And um, I went down to the States for school and and ended up practicing with a guy named Cesar Pelle, who was quite a world famous architect for doing a lot of the biggest buildings in the world. So I was a young architect, and we were building the Burj. Or not, not the, I was about to say the Burj Khalifa. We did not do that. Uh, I was about to say the uh, Petronas Towers, which are the twin towers in Malaysia with the bridge in between. So you know, I got to witness these kind of crazy big projects being built when I worked there as a young architect. And to be honest. I was pretty clueless. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just kind of holding my head above water and them and uh, had some really great friends and I was learning a lot by osmosis, but also not super, you know, not super finding my stride, I'd say, until I moved back here to Canada and I moved to the West Coast and the West Coast of Canada is like the West Coast of the U.S. It's, you know, huge trees and big wilderness and that's definitely my, my, you know, my lifeblood. And so those big trees kind of, brought me back to the idea of timber architecture and that brought me into, you know, being much more sustainable in the way I thought and really engaging the climate crisis and how buildings can be a big part of it. And so that's been the, you know, driver force of architecture for me for more than 20 years now by being out here on the West Coast. That's awesome. Yeah. And out of those projects you've worked on now for the last 20 years in timber, what's the one you're most proud of? Yeah, great question. So um, it's like, you know, every, I think most architects would say it's like children, you don't pick a favorite because they're all like kind of pretty good. But uh, I think for, you know, I have a, my partner, Natalie um, at MGA, she's, um, she and I both would say the same project, which is Ronald McDonald House and our children's hospital in Vancouver. It's, it's actually the first CLT uh, non-residential project ever built in North America. Um, it was the earliest days of CLT here, made with Canadian CLT. Um, it's a house for 73 um, families while their kids are going through cancer treatment at our, our children's hospital. And so its its mission was just incredibly important, but also it's loaded with all this great innovation. But, but most of the great innovation that we care most about is not the environmental stuff, which it had, but really the social stuff that was so much more important for its purpose. And so we love it because it kind of is the project that I think encompasses all of the values that we have as a practice in, in sort of believing that buildings can make people's lives truly better and truly healthier and truly or happier and, and, um, make communities stronger and all those things are wrapped in that project. And then on top of that, it's got this great part of an environmental story and the way we approached it. That's awesome. Yeah. Talking about like creating more healthy buildings, how does mass timber make buildings more healthy and more sustainable? Yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, the fundamental is there's big four structures that you can build buildings out of and all around the world, steel, concrete, masonry, and wood. And, and the first three, steel and concrete and masonry, have this huge carbon footprint. Wood, obviously, it it's, stores carbon. That's why we talk about it so much now in the building industry. It's the only material we can build with that actually stores carbon in it. Major material. There's some, you know, lots of good, and I'll talk about that maybe towards the end, lots of good sort of smaller option materials, but for big, big volumes of buildings, wood's the right choice. And mass timber, which is actually a word that we came up with in the early days when we wrote the first book, 
about tall wood buildings. Um, mouse timber is a product that allows us to use small trees to make big panels to capture carbon in the structural material, but more importantly, build really big buildings. And that, you know, mass timber and cross-laminated timber, that all wraps into being better for the climate. But in turn, we really know how much better it is for humans as well. And so, you know, we did just finish or almost finish our second big building with Google on their main campus. And one of the things, you know, from a research point of view that they did was looking at, well, if, you know, humans are actually, um, you know, surrounded by natural materials, we knew this already, but you, you heal quicker, you learn faster, you work, you know, uh, more productively. And, and they actually looked at it from the point of view of sick days. You have less sick days when you're surrounded by these materials because you are healthier and, and less sick days and more productivity, which has a huge dollar value. And one of the things I like to think about is, you know, these buildings are healthier for an obvious reason. And that's that we as a species are deeply connected to nature only in the last hundred, 150 years. have we really removed ourselves from that relationship with nature and natural materials. And it's not been, it's not been a win for us, right? Being surrounded by these materials, we're constantly finding out that they have toxicity and they have um, health associated issues and psychological and mental health associated issues. And well, natural materials and mass timber being a big part of that helps address that in a really positive way. And with mass timber being uh, a forest product, a lot of people come and ask me, why is mass timber sustainable? Aren't you tearing down a bunch of trees and having less trees grow in the forest means less carbon sequestrated? And so how is mass timber actually sustainable and good for our forests? Yeah. So, so the answer is it's, it's good, but it's not always good. It depends where you get your wood from, right? So it could be terrible. You cut down trees in the wrong place in the forest that doesn't get replanted or doesn't get well managed or, or well considered, then yeah, this would be a bad idea. So it's a really fair question. What is also really important is like anything, it's not a black and white issue. And what really is important is we have sustainable forestry in North America. We have sustainable forestry in Europe and some you know, southern, southern hemisphere areas. And that means we replant and we look after the forest. Now, could we do better? We can always do better. Could you find, you know, flaws? Yes, absolutely. But if we replant the forest, this is a renewable resource. It uses photosynthesis. You're not putting a solar panel between you and making a building material. The sun literally is making the building material. And that's the solution that we have to think about. We are not um, we are using the power of the sun to build buildings. And as long as we do that by replanting and managing forest well, it's a completely sustainable model. The problem we do have and we have to face is that there are other strains on the forest, right? We cut down most deforestation. What people hear about is for agricultural land and it's really worse. It's for cow, right? And, and, and so, um, and cattle, of course, has this compounding problem of, of climate impact. Most deforestation is unrelated to the building industry, but you know that response of what these wood buildings deforest is a is a you know it's a logical question. It's just not actually a, a major concern for us yet. Now, forest fire is going to put some real, you know, as forest fires due to climate change continue to strain us, it's going to put more pressure on the forest, and that's why we have to start thinking about what's next. And I know at the end of this this uh, podcast, we're going to talk a bit more about that. So that's a good foreshadow. Yeah. And so when you have clients come to you and say, I want to build a sustainable building and I want to make sure that I'm buying the wood from forests that are properly managed and they're not going down in clear cutting or going into South America and buying a bunch of wood and bring it to the U.S. What, yeah. what do you recommend and what processes do you have those clients put in place to make sure it's sustainable wood? Yeah, so so a big part of that is choices we make around chain of custody and the kinds of certification programs we could use. So globally, there's four big certification programs in North America. There's two and a half. Um, but like as an example, FSR, which is uh, 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 FSC. FSC. FSC one is, um, yeah. for some reason, I'm totally mentally blocked on it, but we spec FSC typically. FSC is a third-party certification that work, looks at the, the sort of balance of, of the forest economy, the, which impacts the people that, that are earning a living from the forest, the environmental issues, as well as uh, 
um, um, indigenous rights of the people whose land that may be. And so they try to look at that and, and then follow a chain of custody from a tree being felled in the forest all the way to the product ending up in a building to help us understand, did it go through a rigorous, rigorous process? Was it part of a sustainable forestry program? So that's a good, quick way by speckling wood that either comes from SFI, which is another one, or FSC, um, then you're already, you know, have some way of being able to track that. I think those systems can, you know, have ways to go to get better. I think a lot of what we're going to see in the next very short amount of time is with new AI features being added to the forestry process, like everything else in our labs right now. We're, we already have the ability to digitally scan timber, much like a fingerprint, no two pieces of wood can ever be the same. And so we can actually um, look at a digital signature of a, a tree through a CAT scan um, very quickly in the logging process, in the forest, as they're cutting it down and follow every component of that tree all the way through the process, not by stamping it with some digital mark, but actually because the tree itself is its own digital mark, it's its own Thumbprint, and that'll allow us to make sure again that there's truth in advertising that we're actually sourcing wood, or literally we'll be able to to know the, the exact GPS coordinates for each tree and therefore each piece of wood in our building just by that new technology that's coming on stream now. Wow, that's awesome. Do you know who's deploying that? If it is it S F or FSC or SFI? No, no, neither. So, so a lot of this tech is coming, um, it's all, you know, on the leading edge of innovation. And, and the first example of how that's being used is actually not as high tech as that, but it's still very high tech. And so three or four years ago, a Russian scientist and, and a Canadian scientist actually won what's called the Marcus Wellenberg Prize, which is a prize for forestry. It's a big global prize with a lot of money attached to it. And what they did was they really came up with an algorithm that allowed for high-speed CT scanning of logs. And so when a log goes through a mill, you want to know where the knots are. You want to know how to cut that that log into the most efficient use of wood, right? And I'm a big believer that if you cut down a tree, you give it the best, longest life you can ever get. That's how you honor the life of the tree. And that's to put it in a building that will stand for 100 years or a piece of furniture that will exist for hundreds of years. Um, not turning into paper or some waste product or formwork for concrete, right? And so if you do that and you run it through this CT scan, this algorithm, they were able to very quickly allow a 20% higher yield, so a higher amount of production in the logging industry by being able to see where all the imperfections and knots are to be able to cut the wood at, like within a fraction of a second, make the choices as it goes through the mill to cut the wood in the most efficient way. So that's literally like taking the forest and 10 to 20 percent of the trees throwing them away versus actually making them usable because they figured out that simple technology of high speed ct scale so they they introduced that to mills that's being sold worldwide on mills right now but the next step is that that'll start to go on on the actual tool that is stripping the bark and stripping the, the, the limbs off the tree and then snipping the tree in the forestry system. And so they'll be literally digitizing as they, they cut the tree down. And so uh, I'm not sure when that gets implemented, but I see that as being the next thing. And then the last thing will be, and I think, again, we're going to be five years out where you can go up to a piece of wood and scan it. And it'll give you, if it's gone through that system, of course, if it's a newer tree that's been cut, that scan will be like a fingerprint and you'll be able to get the record of where that tree, what forest was it in, what, what, um, you know, who cut it down, what, um, what process it was part of as far as following its chain of custody. So, um, AI is a big, scary thing, but it's, it's something that's going to uh, have some really positive benefits and that's sort of. Yeah, that's awesome. One of the things you mentioned about the sustainability certificates is they have a community aspect to it. And so maybe you could talk a little bit more on that of like what they're doing for the communities of these forest communities that is healthy and, and good. Yeah. I mean, one of the really important things in society today is that we see, I think all of us do, I'm in Canada, you're in the States, but we see this in, in many, many developed countries and democracies is this divide that's happening. And it's a divide that's happening politically, but it's also a divide that really is happening between rural economies and urban economies. 
And there's a disconnect of people that, that live in cities not understanding where the things that they're surrounded by, where did they come from, right? They came from rural communities. And, and that disconnect has created a kind of attitude of we want more environmental, don't cut down trees or don't do things that are depleting our resources, which makes people in rural economies feel like they're doing something wrong. That divide can be healed by a greater respect on the idea that we need each other and we need we need our rural communities to thrive and survive and keep jobs and people to be able to raise their families. And that means um, how forestry is done in a sustainable way it means really understanding that those jobs aren't temporary, they're long-term jobs, and that the people of those communities have to be valued. It's their forest. They live next to it. They don't want to tear it down. They certainly want to regrow it. They look at it every day. They're not there to destroy the planet. They're there to make a living and to help the rest of us live better lives in cities. And so I think the the, the community-based qualities of how we think about this is really important. I'm a huge believer in supporting rural communities. Um, and and part of that is through these, these systems, we also have to acknowledge, and this is a probably a bigger conversation for us here in Canada, that it, indigenous rights around land is part of the formula, right? So the forestry model in Canada and the U.S. is quite different. In Canada, it's mostly on public land. In the U.S., it's mostly on private land. That difference is quite big when it comes to indigenous people who originally owned that public land in Canada and probably and owned the private land in the U.S. but have a harder access to it now in the U.S., and so in Canada, we're really grappling with making sure that indigenous communities, just like any other rural community, has access to the economic benefit of forestry within their community. And actually, one step further, we're working pretty hard to bring, you know, fabrication and high value, value add fabrication around forest products like CLT plants in the smaller rural communities and in indigenous communities. And so that is a really important. And it's interesting because I deeply care about this stuff. And I know it's for some people that are architects and might be like, wow, that's like in the weeds, but it's not in the weeds. Everything has a source. And we know the source and care about the people and the planet. It actually can be part of us doing our job as just being architects. Yeah. I mean, you were as architects and I think as developers kind of driving the demand and we have to understand where the supply chain is for that demand. So right. otherwise we're going to mm -hmm. lose it. Um, yeah. I think this is this is a good segue into some of the stuff you're doing in Stockholm in Sweden. But we were just in in Stockholm in Sweden at separate times, yeah. uh, and like a week apart. We, right? yeah. yeah, exactly. Uh, but we both got to meet with this cool company, uh, which is a wood products company and also forest company, and they're doing it like I think the best way possible. It's Sodra. Um, and they have 52,000 owners and it's all basically Southern Sweden is all owned by this one, uh, co cooperative. And so I'm like, that is so cool. How do we adopt that in the U S and in Canada, you know, cause that it feels like the best, most like democratized approach to both forestry and mass timber. Um, yeah, but yeah maybe well, and, and in, in some ways canada this is the difference because canada actually in a weird way is similar on an even bigger scale because we cut down trees on public land um and part of the reason i was so supported in the work i was doing in the early days of this timber stuff is the government here really supported it because that's my dog the taxpayer is an owner of our forest and when we forest that means the taxpayer is a like a beneficiary of the forestry sector. So it's the same as, as the model. And so it's a bigger model in Canada. But because of that, the Canadian government makes money on every tree cut down, which means the taxpayer in Canada makes money on every tree cut down, which means we are all invested in the future of forestry, much like that example in Sweden. Um, so it is a bit different already in Canada. That's an even more intimate model where people more closely connected to the forest or direct owners a little. Um, but it's a good model. I, I like it. The U.S. isn't going to do that, right? Because yeah, <laughs> the model is so different. We could go. We could get into the weeds of like how how would be people would call it socialism and all kinds of other stuff. But it's it's um, it, it it's an important concept that people value their communities and value the land, and we have to um, 
you know, the more they're connected to the atomic benefit, the more they're also connected to preservation. Those are mutually exclusive. And yeah. Sweden's fascinating on all these levels, right? So we were going to talk actually about some projects because we're in the weeds on forestry, but, but yeah, talk about some projects too. Yeah, yeah. So tell me, uh, tell me what MGA is working on in Stockholm. Yeah, so I mean, we have a building actually we're doing way in the north of Sweden right now in a place called Yellowbar, which is a big timber. It's called a multi-activity house, so it's everything from theaters and restaurants to gymnasiums and swimming pools and climbing wall and is it ice climbing wall, which is for me, and that's my thing, and it, it, it's awesome. But we're, so we're already working in the north, and we've just been asked and and to start working in Stockholm on a project that um, and on a few projects, one one very large project, but um, more directly a project that I was really excited about because it's it's part of a change we're going through in our practice and becoming a we call it an LCA driven design practice. And, and what that means is life cycle assessment, LCA. But it really, what it means is that you're making, instead of designing and then picking materials and then measuring what that looks like as far as your carbon input, you really, every, every part of the earliest design process is a measuring experience where you're actually calculating as you go. Now, this is going to get much easier with AI. But what it says is that we're making very, very early conscious decisions about design. We teamed up with a developer now that um, has basically won a competition in its early days for Stockholm, which is based on you get as much area as you want to build for a project on a site, which is unique, but it's limited based on the amount of carbon per residence on the pro project you build. And so basically, if you're really, really efficient on carbon, you can build a huge project and make lots of money. If you're not very good on carbon, you can you don't get to build a very big project and you won't make as much money, but you're allowed to build. And so what it says is the more innovative and the more you care about carbon, the more money you're going to make. And that's the kind of incentivizing of change and innovation that we need everywhere, right? That's To me, that's the kind of public policy that we should have everywhere as soon as possible. And what I love about it, it's much like that political divide between you know, that we see in lots of places between rural economies and, and urban economies. That's the same conversation in the development community, right? It's like, oh, uh, developers, they're, you know, making all this money and they're, they're you know, uh, making housing unaffordable. Well, that's, I don't think that's really true, but there are people who believe that. And then there are people that are like, well, they don't care about the environment. Well, that's not true either. This is a great way of saying, look, you care about the environment, you're going to make lots of money, go for it. That's in the best interest of society, and we all want that. And that basically politically aligns right and left in a really positive way, which is the solution to everything is when we bring the parties together. And so I think about that, that sort of political alignment um, in policy is the single most important thing we can do. It is not bad to make money and do good things for the environment. We want that to happen at the same time because that's what it, that's what drives the mission. And, and what we're doing now on this project will be entirely about that. You know, we have we have to research the hell out of that project from day one in order to help them make more money and make a bigger project. And that's cool. That's really fun. And I know yeah. it's a side of the future. That's awesome. Yeah, a few follow-up questions on that. Uh, one is on LCA which uh, we're going to talk about in a future episode. We dive deep with Andrew Wall um, on it. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about it was with Andrew, we were kind of talking about the end of life assumptions and he's doing a lot of work on how do we assess mass timber from an end of life perspective, because there's so many assumptions out there that so many people have and we yeah. really need, need a standard. But maybe you could just like walk the audience through what the LCA is and then how you're using it from the start at feasibility, it sounds like, all the way through construction drawings. Yeah. So, you know, it, in a weird way, like L life cycle assessment work is like, it's a little bit like cooking. That's how I always look at it. It's like you're making soup and, you, and, and it's got to, at the end of the day, be nutritious. And so, but, you know, it's got to taste good too. So you, you're going to probably want to add a few things that maybe aren't ideal on the nutritious side to get it to taste good. Well, that's kind of the building process. That when I start the soup as, as a building by choosing mass timber, I'm already making it super healthy. I've already got this big carbon sequestering solution that keeps my carbon footprint down. 
But then I add aluminum to it for the window system or glass to it, and it's making it worse and worse and worse, right? That's one's pulling me down and lowering my carbon and one's raising. And so I want to use as little aluminum as possible, but especially when it looks just like off the charts high from a carbon footprint point of view. Obviously, I'm going to have glass, although I'm use that as intelligently as possible. And and so now I'm calculating those things based on the life of the building, not just that initial carbon, right? The initial carbon is the embodied carbon. How much carbon did it take to make the glass? Versus the life of the carbon is that that glass is bringing in daylight. It's also a place where the envelope is a little weaker and the insulation isn't as thick, so the cold will come out, will go out or come in. And so it allows me to start thinking really carefully about what the right choices are in the long term for the lowest carbon solution. And a, a good way to think about it is this, is that there's two, two, two things I'll give you as an example. Parking, I'll start with parking. Two thirds of the carbon footprint of most of our projects is in the, the concrete in the park. Two thirds. I, it doesn't matter how much mass timber I throw at it, I'm just fighting car, I'm fighting parking, right? And so there has to be, and I, we have lots of ideas about this, but there has to be massive innovation to reduce the size of parking garages, or we're just really never going to get the mix of the soup to work properly, right? The carbon footprint's just too bloody big because of that. So that's one thing we can take a big look at. Another example is glass. And this is where this, this process is counterintuitive. You may think, so glass, insulated glass will be two panes of glass with airspace control. And there's lots of different formulas that make it a good insulator. You can buy three panes of glass and it's even better. It's the thing is three panes of glass is one more sheet of glass, which has a carbon footprint, an embodied carbon footprint from the, from the beginning. And you have to actually calculate does the carbon story of the building over its life get better with that better insulation? Or is it worse because you had a higher amount of carbon making three sheets of glass instead of two? And believe it or not, for most projects, you may find that the carbon footprint's better to only have two pieces of glass, not three. So the assumption that, oh, I should just like add stuff to make it more insulated and that's better for the environment isn't actually always true. And so we want to understand that from a deep analytical point of view in this life cycle assessment design process so that we're making the best choice for the life of the building, not what we think is the best choice, which is not always true. And that requires calculation. That it requires spending the energy to really do the math on it, of the, of the implications of each of these choices. Um, so insulations, the third one, I said I'd talk about two things, but insulation is another one. Some of them, you might be able to insulate the building and make it much more energy efficient. But if you choose the wrong insulation, the carbon footprint of the insulation is so high that you're actually doing more damage to the environment and to climate change by picking the wrong insulation than using a lot of insulation. And so that's why it's never a simple, like, use this and that's the answer. It's much more complicated in each building. We need to understand it in that level of detail. On the on the garage, I'm going to jump back to the parking garage because I think it's a hugely important topic and we need, I, I just actually did a talk this morning to Infrastructure Canada who are responsible for building all the Canadian roads, trains, on you know, all bridges, everything. I spoke to the whole aspect arm of government that does that in Canada. And, but and the before reason, we, yeah, yeah. yeah. But before we jump back to the parking garage, because I do want to touch on that as well, I just yeah. have a follow-up question to your, your window analogy, which I yeah, like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what what are you doing with the LCA that's allowing you to see what should sounds like both the embodied and operational carbon at the same time? Are you like doing an energy model that's integral yeah. to the LCA? Correct. So your energy okay. model, just part that's just part of it. So you're running a live stream energy model, and of course with Revit and the, and and all the bolt ins and now with artificial intelligence, we're at we're getting it's getting a lot easier to do this, right? Where we we can have a lot of more of that metadata built into the model from the beginning, you know, from the we're making a box and we can already start to make those assumptions. Um, but and we we're able much better now to capture real life, you know, site specific conditions using AI tools too, and that's all just getting better. But yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. We're doing an energy model. That's just tied. That's just part of it. I mean, that's why we do an energy model anyway, right? We're trying to understand it in the context of the LCA. Cool. Okay. Yeah, no, in regards to parking though, I'd love to talk more about how 
which was a huge surprise for me how two thirds of the carbon in most of your projects comes from parking. How are yeah. you going to mitigate that and what strategies do you have? Yeah, so and then the, the key is, of course, most jurisdictions say you have to have parking or the market says you have to have parking to sell units, right? And so in the near future, we're not getting rid of parking. But we're also not doing a very good job about forecasting you know, if we start a project today and it's not going to be finished in five years, which is unfortunately common, um, you know, I wish it was faster, but it takes time. Um, what's the world going to be like five years from now? Well, we're probably like a month away from having artificial general intelligence, if not a week away from having artificial general, general intelligence, getting what happened last week in ChatGPT. So, um, like, the level of rapid acceleration of innovation is. I think few of us, or if any of us, even have even the people who wrote ChatGPT, can even understand what level of innovation is going to happen in five years. But we're making this building using all the certain dumb models we use today that are going to be incredibly dumb models in five years. And so, and all we can do is do our best and try to predict what's next. And so, when it comes to parking, as an example, um, you know, we build a parking garage with this massive ramp that drives you up and pathway that leads you to your, you know, to your parking space. And you have one car per parking space. And we, we know that if you go to a hotel and you hand your keys to a valet, they stack a bunch of cars together, right? And they stack them together because they have all the keys in their pocket and they can move some cars around to get your car out. And so they can densify the amount of parking in my garage. Well, Today, we don't have driverless cars, right? Self-drive cars. We, we do. Well, I mean, if you own a Tesla, you can self-drive. But we've got most of the systems turned off. And that's because the, the world currently is not ready for driverless cars from a safety point of view. Our expectation is a fascinating thing. is like zero accidents, even though humans have tons of accidents. The idea of a driverless car having an accident is, is too high for our comfort level to allow but the one thing we could turn on right now in those cars is the ability to enter a parking garage and drive to a parking space. Because there's no, if the humans aren't in that parking garage, there's no safety issue. Which means that even in today's technology, with the existing fleet of self drive cars, they could be parking themselves in this very dense way using far less of the footprint of a garage than we, than we currently have to build for the ability to drive in ourselves, right? So you ask yourselves, if you're a developer thinking about these ideas, and, and by the way, there are all kinds of cool systems that, you know, are robotic and they elevator systems that park your car. Sure, those are all good, but not every project's big enough to support that kind of technology. Yeah, maybe in the future. But this self-drive concept, it, it, it's, it's really interesting because we assume, well, that's 10 years from now. It's not, it's actually now technology. And if developers start pricing parking based on the idea that it's cheaper if you're in the valet area or the self-drive area than you are in the, you want to drive it yourself, your parking space costs more. You start to see people make conscious choices to buy cars that actually are self-drive. And in the interim, what's really interesting, the cost of a parking space in a typical parking garage is between forty and $60,000 to build it, depending on where you live and some of those choices. And this is in a parking garage structure. Well, that means one parking space more efficient in a parking garage pays for a valet for an entire year, a job, somebody to actually do the job. So if we can take the footprint of a typical garage full of all of its drive lanes and densify it by 50% more cars, for the next 10 years, we do have a whole ton of people employed moving cars around, only to be ready for the reality that that will all be self-driving in the future and the density and the size and the carbon footprint and the cost will all be far smaller than the current model of assuming that we need to drive. There are other layers of that, which is that now you just pull up, you got your groceries, you just pull up, get out at the elevator lobby and go up the elevator and let your car do its thing, which is what people in high-end buildings like. But we need to treat this as not a high-end building technology, it's an every building technology because... Some people need jobs, developers are make more money, the carbon footprint will be lower and the experience will be better, but we have to retrain, right? People resist change. We have to retrain a mindset around why that actually is amazing. You're not hunting for a parking space or you're not hunting for a 
elevator in that parking garage you don't know and you're not scared that you might get you know assaulted in that parking garage because now you're just getting out in the beautiful lobby and letting your car do its thing. So those are the ways that people can make more money, have a better experience, and reduce their carbon footprint today. That doesn't even speak to what we'll be dreaming up five years from now, right? And yet, almost nobody's doing that today. Almost nobody's innovating in the parking garage today, other than, yeah, the Rubik's Cube kind of robotic systems, which are all awesome. But as I say, they kind of need impossible amount of density to make sense currently. So, yeah, no, this is awesome, actually, because we had this issue at the project we're working on in Madison together. Um, and I don't think we've spoken about it, but we're contemplating doing this type of scenario, not with a self-driving, but just with valet. And now I'm like, this is brilliant. We should do it with self-driving. But basically our thought is, um, just for the audience sake, we built our, our building with Michael at 206 unit building in Madison. And we only have 125 parking stalls. So we're at like about a 60% ratio. Um, and so the idea that we're likely going to put in place is to have valets do exactly what Michael's talking about, which is instead of people parking their cars in our three-story underground parking, the valets get to do the whole jigsaw puzzle and park it themselves. And right now it's looking like we're able to get it up to almost one-to-one -one parking ratio but we don't have to spend the extra money on parking. And it would have been way more than 60,000 a stall in Madison because we had to go underground and that's below the water table. Right. So uh, yeah, I, this is making me want to do it that much more. Right. This yeah. is great. Yeah, I, and, and this is just the beginning, right? Like it's so fun in the current context to imagine like the car, the single family car is not going away anytime soon, you know? Uh, well, maybe, you know, we'll, car share maybe, will someday become the only mainstream way to do it. But um, but there's all these other fascinating things, right? I like mean, this morning when I was talking to this inf infrastructure Canada, as they say, they're responsible for building our cities and our roads, right? It's the government. And I said, you know, that in Canada, there's a road called the Trans-Canada Highway. It's like literally the only highway that goes from one side of Canada. It's like I-90 in the States, right? And, and um, I was like, you know what, guys, here's what I would suggest. I'm kind of like joking with them. I'm like, you know, on a farm road where you're driving and there's like a track for one tire and a track for the other tire and in between it's grass. The trans Canada Highway should be built with a strip of concrete and a strip of concrete and everything else grass. And this strip of concrete should be about this wide, maybe this wide. And that's it. And that's how we should. And they're like, I, I was like, I know you're listening. Maybe on this guy crazy, this stupidest idea. And I'm like, if you built it that way, we would probably reduce the amount of car creep by 75%. But more importantly, the moment you have a self-drive car, they don't need any of that other car creep. They can drive just fine in a straight line like that. Yeah. It's humans that can't drive on that. So the whole concept of what a road is, is in 10 years going to be a completely different thing than what a road is today. And there'll be people like me. I drive a 1959 Land Rover electric car, right? It's like antique thing. And I'll probably keep driving that 10 years from now. And there'll be people that do. They love their car and they want to drive it. But the rule will start to become, that's okay. You're just not allowed on certain roads that driverless cars can go on. And you'll have to make a personal choice whether you want the most efficient one, which is not going to be driving my car. Um, and then, and, or, I mean, it's pretty, it's very efficient from, a, from an environmental point of view. I mean, I can't drive very fast. Look like um, so, but like, you know what I mean? That the, the system will be designed for the most efficient solution to make people, the quality of people's life, the majority of the quality of people's life, the best. It shouldn't be dragged down because somebody wants to keep owning their, you know, 1962 Chevy pickup truck. Yeah. Shouldn't be forced to sell it, but they shouldn't own the road forever because yeah. they are better, more modern tools that should be driving the future. And that's how so, spur innovation. Right? So as we talk about innovation, I know we want to have a segment, which is, is a good segue into the future of city building. And so what are you and MGA as a practice doing to kind of reimagine our cities and urban infrastructure? So, so, so I don't fully know where this is going to go, but one of the things I've been really interested in that I did talk to these guys at Infrastructure Canada about today, and this would apply to America as well, is that 
And, and we kind of all know this answer. If you've ever been to Europe, you know that you can just hop on a train and pop between great city from great city to great city. And that's what we all, as North Americans, we're all, we go over there, we're like, oh man, this is amazing. And then we come back here and get in our cars. Um, COVID taught us that people want to be outdoors. People want a relationship with nature. The national park system in the U.S. and Canada became like totally overburdened. And um, we know the suburb is a terrible thing for from a climate point of view and an infrastructure point of view. And so what we were hopefully going to launch is a, an exploration. We live in a corridor from Vancouver to the, to the, we have lots of mountains, but one mountain range further to the east of us, that's about an hour and a half drive. You know, it's about well, in miles, it's probably like a hundred miles. And I think we should actually, right now there's big, I'm like little towns. But I actually think the answer for us is going to be 15 cities between us and the mountains. And the point is a city isn't a mega city of millions of people. A city is 100,000 people. And if you look at what's happening in China, they build cities around industry, right? So it's like, this is going to be the car battery city. And this is going to be the LED light city. And they build all their infrastructure. I don't think that works in our more democratic model. But I do think building a, a train corridor connecting 15 cities where we live allows us to reinvent the city we're going to either densify and make housing so expensive in Vancouver, where I live, which is like one of the most expensive cities in the world, or we start spreading it out in this way that allows us to reinvent the city um, from a more green, from a green you know, uh, field kind of approach. It allows us to get energy right. It allows us to create walkable cities. It allows us to build in timber. It allows us to create closer connection to nature, closer connection to parks. And in theory, allows us to brand cities along this corridor, which if you think about it, it'll be like 15, 20 minute train rides that are culturally different. You know, this one is, and I don't mean like different national cultures. I don't mean that, but like this one, this city has got all the sports venues and that's where you pop on the train and you go and see sports. And this one's all arts and theater and, and culture. And this one is, you know, connected to a national park and this one. And so it creates this opportunity to create this really dynamic experience of moving between places on a train in an efficient way. And it allows us to take all this broken infrastructure that's so expensive to fix and starts to like it, it build these new city centers in the most correct way. And ideally, you know, it's kind of a suburban version of urban. It's saying we need to start over outside the city but we still need to be building cities and we need people to be walking in those cities. And so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, that currently working with infrastructure Canada, our goal is to, to really do a prototype series of what Canada, and I think this could happen between Seattle and Portland. I think this could happen between a lot of cities in America could develop this same concept, which again, it would start to feel like you're, you just on and off training and visiting different areas. Um, you know, you can spend a weekend and, and like in Europe, you can be, on a train between Paris and Amsterdam and have an amazing weekend in a completely different place and then pop home again. Well, that can happen in some parts of the U.S., but for the most part, it doesn't happen anywhere. And it can yeah. and should, and it'd be good for you. Yeah, no, I love that idea. I mean, it would be awesome if we could do something like that from Seattle to Portland to San Francisco to L.A. to San Diego, because yeah. it would, I think, really help people. Instead of sprawling out, they would just focus on the dense areas like and then just exactly they would just go to a dens different densified area yeah and right now like especially in the u.s we have this just great sprawl that i think we all see all over the place yeah and so if you want to get to nature like you're sitting in traffic for like an hour and a half to get out of your city right and i think that's the scale problem right We're, we've made our cities we've let our cities I don't, i'm not a believer that we should have these super cities i think we should have lots and lots of you know small cities um, that really focus on human well-being and human connection, and, you know, really address like loneliness and a lot of these other epidemics we're seeing in big cities that, that big cities are not solved, you know, with a few exceptions, they're not solved. Yeah. No, that's a great idea. I love that. Um, transitioning into something we touched on earlier and it's in regards to five, which I know is something very new for you. Um, and you, you had a TED talk on it. So I think if people want to learn a lot more, they should go watch the TED talk, but maybe you could give us a couple kind of key points on why you created five. Yeah. So, so 
the, the word five comes from the idea that there are four structures that built the world. Almost every major city, it's steel, or actually every major city, steel, concrete, masonry, and wood. And those are the four big four structures. And there are lots of other secondary ones, but those are the big four. And the way I always look at it is if we had known 150 years ago at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, the impact, the negative climate and environmental impact, some of the choices were, we were making, we probably would have chosen something quite different or innovated something like that. And there's a quote I like that says, I'll tell you who said it in a second, but the, the quote says, and it's from 1910, and the quote says, um, it would, if it was up to me, I would focus on solar. I wouldn't want to wait until oil and gas run out before we figure that out. So in 1910, somebody said, and what's most interesting to me is the person that said it was Thomas Edison. So Thomas Edison, the, like the inventor of the light bulb, basically, you know, the guy that literally the symbol of the idea is the light bulb, right? Knew at 110 years ago that that was a good idea for us to pursue before oil and gas ran out, right? And yet it didn't, it didn't happen, right? Nobody, nobody latched onto that idea. But when it comes from a building point of view, we're in that same moment. We know that these three of the big four materials, right? Not wood, but the other three have this massive carbon footprint. And what we're doing is trying to make them a tiny bit better. We're trying to fix really bad solutions and make them a little tiny bit better. And we're spending billions and billions of dollars trying. And I, I encourage that. We need to keep doing that. But in parallel, we should be asking ourselves, if those are the big four materials, what's the fifth? And what, what's the fifth based on the values we have and the knowledge we have about society today? And what we know, I think all of us know, is that that's got to be a nature-based system. I believe it's got to be a plant-based system. And it needs to basically replace, be an offset, replace just like wood, but solve the problem globally because climate change is a global issue. And especially in parts of the world where trees don't grow or wood isn't a solution or where we shouldn't cut down, wood, like, you know, in Brazil or in, in parts of Russia and parts of China. So, so... Our idea is basically to develop a plant-based structure to create a global network. We call it five, it's fifth way. And the idea is to create this global network around plant-based technology and structure. We have a specific model that we're looking at, but there may be others. And we want to support the idea of a, of a radical shift, global shift and investment in plant-based technology. And it's not because we're going to be doing using that stuff tomorrow. It's because we damn well better figure out how to be using that stuff within 10 years or 20 years. And just like in 1910, Edison knew we shouldn't be focused on solar and we didn't do anything. We're not going to make that mistake again. We know this is the answer. We need to be, as a voice, as building professionals and, and people that care about this, need to be huge advocates in raising the money, raising the awareness, raising the focus, seeing the opportunity. And the way I describe it to the business community, because I think at the end of the day, this happens when people realize that it's worth investing in. It's not just the science, it's the investment. The way people should wrap their head around it, which I love saying this because it feels outrageous, is that those four building materials represent the largest volume of materials man makes on earth, right? By far. Buildings, physically, by physical volume, carpet, steel, masonry, wood, those are the largest volumes of material man makes on earth. I mean, actually agricultural waste, which is like, you know, corn husks is actually the biggest. But besides that, that means that if we figure out an alternative to those, it could well be the single largest economic change in human history. That's how big the economic opportunity is. Like Tesla's a laughable joke in scale compared to fixing the problem of the building industry. And, and cars are like a minutia of the footprint on the scale of this opportunity. And yet currently very, very little innovation is being pursued. And it's because it's, it resides in ac academia. It doesn't know how to see the light of day. It's hard for people with startup companies to get specified. There's massive regulatory roadblocks that prevent it, building codes, testing to make it reality. We know that from wood, how hard that's been. Um, and the biggest one is the investment community hasn't woken up to the scale of this opportunity and put the put their money into something that would be, you know, a huge economic win, but more importantly, 
um, really actually put us on the road to addressing climate change. And without this, or I believe we're in trouble and we'll remain in trouble. But I think this is possible and we're going to put a lot of energy into it. That's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like a really cool idea. And so when you guys say you're putting a lot of energy into it, are you planning to make this material or are you developing the intellectual property and then you're going to sell it to a, a VC or manufacturer to be able to make it? I, I won't do any IP on anything ever. That's a philosophy I have. The Tallwood Building Movement, um, I specifically wrote the first book on it about with a with a caveat that said um, it was a Creative Commons license, which meant that nobody could profit, nobody could write an IP out. And the reason I did that is that to make good ideas happen, you can't own it. And the people looked at me like I was insane when I gave my first TED Talk. All these VCs wanted to talk to me about how I was going to make money. And I was like, I'm not. I don't care. It's not what it motivates me. And the, the lesson I learned through Tallwood was that the, the international media jumped on it. That got a lot of attention. That got me the TED Talk. The TED Talk turned it into 30 languages and found a couple of million hits. And that really help change the industry. I mean, a lot of people like Andrew, who's out of the core, I think the other person and partner in this with me, was it, 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 it needed to be given away for free. And what I learned from the media is they said, you know, the, the only reason we talked about Tallwood in the early days is because it was so weird to us that you gave it away for free. We were like, what? There must be something here. They're like, if this guy was like, if this was a company and he was making money, we never would have talked about it. They would have said, buy some advertising, but we would never have discussed it. It was the weirdness of giving it away for free that made it happen. Hmm. And I knew inherently that at some point it would benefit us as well. But I wasn't obsessed with this concept of IP that basically stifles innovation and is self-serving and doesn't solve big, complicated global problems like climate change. And so that's why I'm, I'm a pretty, I don't mind, I'm more than happy for people to make money, but I'm not, I'm a big believer that five has to be creative commons license to make sure it actually happens. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really admirable. I think uh, that would be awesome to see kind of the industry adopt this. I mean, it's kind of similar to concrete, right? Now it's a commoditized material that anyone can go and yeah. make. And or I think that's one of the reasons. Steel, right? Steel's the same. Yeah. Yeah. So is that kind of your vision for this, that it's basically yeah. a, a recipe, so to speak, for a more sustainable material that anyone yeah, could go make? Exactly. And it actually, it's even more than that. So the idea, just for the audience, it's it's basically taking a plant, which is a combination of of cellulose and, and organic binder lumen that, and, that hold together these fibers, right? That's any vascular plant or a tree, they're all tree is a vascular plant, they're all uh, made of those components. And our goal is to break down those components, and people are doing this in different ways, and reconstitute it in a kind of structural form. And actually, what we're most curious about is it's almost like micro CLT. We're, we're looking really carefully at a very fine grain, how we create bonding with the, of these sort of minute fibers, great sorry. And, and so if we can successfully do that, the point is that different plants will work. And why that's so important is we want plants around the world to be appropriate by region and appropriate to um, the agriculture, climate, topography of that region, not be somehow um, globalized, right? Was it like, we don't want to, it's like the story, we, we, we're not interested in sort of deciding it's going to be all salal plant, everybody in the world grows salal. That's not the idea. The idea is in each region of the world, the appropriate plant then gets studied of how it works within this framework so that we have many, many, many different plants and other fiber sources. And that includes, you know, clearing branches from the forest floor to reduce forest fire. That fiber can be used taking construction of wood waste using that. That fiber can be used, um, you know, where they cut the plot for the power lines to run through the forest. All those branches can be used. The, the goal is to take every ounce of fiber source and even the actually the agricultural waste I, I mentioned before and find a ways to use that waste. If we can unlock this problem, it'll be very diverse how it's used with this common thread that a plant can replace every single thing in every room. Like I, I always challenge the audience to look around the room they're in or even the computer they're staring at and tell them that with technology we have today, 
we could already pretty much make any you can see in the room, including things like like wood wing then could be used to make anything that looks plastic in front of you. We could make an identical version of that in Lingen using today's technology and Dow Corning's already doing. Wow. Um, this isn't, this isn't future as this is now. It's just not now on scale and it's not now on, on, uh, you know, and, and it's complex when it comes to building structure. It's easy if you're, you know, making like, you know, power adapter or a phone, it's actually really easy because there's not a lot of regulation on this. It's hard on a building where you need to know it's going to survive an earthquake or a storm or um, a fire and all those kinds of issues, right? So it's it's a lot harder for us to do this, but it doesn't mean the wall. It just means to harness the global power of money and, and uh, innovation. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it sounds like a really exciting material, and I'm looking forward to follow the process to see how it evolves over the next few years. Yeah. Um, I know to kind of conclude, you're working on a few of the projects with the Neutral Project and... I wanted to touch on one that we're working on together in Milwaukee, uh, yeah. which is in response to this RFP, which yeah. as I've been looking at it, it looks like you have a, a pretty tall building plan. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what your ideas are there. Yeah, it's a cool site, right? It's a really, the Marcus Center site is a super cool site um, in Milwaukee, which is a really cool town. And and uh, this is a, it's a big project. It's got a lot of density in it, which means, you know, one of the greatest things that's happening in all cities, but this will be a great thing in Minneapolis is when people live downtown, that downtown thrives at night. And, um, what's, what's so nice about the site is it's, you know, walk from this like river walk and the, the historic region the street that kind of has this, all this nightlife activity already. So that density is going to just empower the center of Milwaukee even more. And because it's connected to um, the, the sort of cultural context of its neighborhood, um, we're excited about it. It's got a hotel, it's got residential, it's got office, it's got a lot of retail, and it's got this great connectivity into this neighborhood network. Um, and it's and it's big. <laughs> and that includes tall. I mean, I think the last version I saw was 44 stories, but I, I'm not sure where we're at right now. It's, it's pretty big. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was I was talking with Daniel, and I said we should uh, add to the RFP that uh, we are wanting to keep Milwaukee home to the tallest wood yeah. building in the world. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be overtaken by the one in Australia, which I think is at like 47. So maybe we could add six more floors to. Uh, I feel like we it. could definitely do that, and and probably should because. Um, the density makes sense there, right? It's actually a good place for the height. There's a kind of, you know, what I love about sort of the the, the sort of simple version of city building is you, you stand on the edge of the city and you draw this arc of height. You know, like you look at the horizon, you're like low, I low. And so if you do that in Milwaukee, our site, it sits right where you want the highest building. And yeah. so, you know, one of the cool things about tall buildings is and, and I'm not by any means like obsessed with tall buildings um, by any means, but, and, and we don't actually do a ton of tall, buildings. but what's really nice about them in, in many cities is they become the beacon, right? Like a hundred years ago, that would have been the steeple of the church that kind of gives you orientation, you know, which way West is or North is. For me, it's the mountains of Vancouver to the North, but um, in cities that don't have, you know, mountains the buildings become that sort of like orientation. And I think we don't really appreciate how important that is in cities that don't have that, that have, you know, the orientation. Orientation creates stronger neighborhoods, actually. It creates more identity. It actually creates greater human connection. I mean, it's a very important driver of human emotion that we don't put a lot of value. And so a tall building can really help do that as you see it in different distance from around the city. And again, not very many people talk about that. But I think there's more, um, more important human importance than we realize. Uh, which is why steeples were built tall. It's not an accident. Churches chose to do that. So. Yeah, yeah. A reference back to Europe when we were in Austria, it was like every single small town had that steeple you're talking about, and it was by far the tallest structure in the town. So, yeah, yeah. And it, and it and it feels like a it's like a symbol of who you are. Right, it's got yeah. all this great stuff to it, or 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 bad. Like there are bad examples for sure, but um, mostly it can be great. Yeah, 
Um, well, thanks for coming on, Michael. Really happy that you accepted our invitation to join the podcast. And uh, where could people find you and Five and MGA if they want to learn more about? Yeah, uh, so I mean, we have a we have a yeah, Michael Green uh, Architecture um, MGA is um, our website, and by all means, search us there and reach out if you have something interesting you want to chat, chat about. Um, on TED.com, you can search Michael Green Architect when you pick up both of my TED Talks there. Um, one that's 10 years old, one that's from the spring. And uh, the spring is about five. The one 10 years ago is about tall wood buildings. And um, there's lots of other, like, honestly, just Google us. And there's lots of content out there, what we're up to. But um, we appreciate um, anybody reaching out that's interested in what we're up to. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on. And I'm sure we'll talk soon. Yeah, sure. See you then. At The Neutral Project, we're not just building structures. We're building a legacy of sustainability, helping align your investments with a sustainable future. We'd like to thank you for being part of this conversation. For more information and to stay up to date on how we're reshaping the future through environmentally conscious development, visit our social media accounts or our website at theneutralproject.com. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time on the Neutral Podcast.